This video was brought to you by Displate. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So this is Jerry Maguire. If you are under 30, you are probably not terribly familiar with it. It was a comedy drama romance type movie directed by Cameron Crowe and released in December of 1996. It stars Tom Cruise as a cynical sports agent who represents a football player played by Cuba Gooding Jr. And Tom falls in love with the lovely Renee Zellweger, a co-worker who recently lost her husband. It is basically a textbook example of a 90s era feel-good movie in which a bunch of flawed characters learn and grow and laugh and love. It got mostly positive reviews, although I would say it is hardly Remember it as some great masterpiece of cinema today. If you were conscious or in the time of its release, you probably have particularly strong memories of the TV commercials used to promote it, which featured a clip of what would become the movie's most iconic scene and quote. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 show you the money. Not, not show you, show me the money. Show me the money. Yeah! Louder! Show me the money! Jerry, you better yell! Show me the money! But even if you have no memory of any of this, it is possible you have still heard of the movie anyway. And that's because Jerry Maguire has become a very good example of the sort of unique cultural phenomena that we're going to be talking about today, which is irony cults. So, broadly speaking, I would say that an irony cult exists whenever a lot of obsessive energy is directed towards some piece of mainstream middle-class culture for reasons other than sincere appreciation. It is different from a fandom in that way, because fandoms are of course communities that are quite explicit about just straight up loving a particular cultural thing on its own terms. But an irony cult isn't a community of haters either, it is a movement somewhere in between. Between. In the case of Jerry Maguire, people around my age have made all sorts of weird, emotionally ambiguous art about the film, usually art that is more about the movie as a literal object or 90s era cliche than the film's plot or characters or anything like that. Consider the song Jerry's Theme by the musician Mike Diva, for instance. The undisputed kings of the Jerry Maguire irony cult, however, are an LA-based art collective known as Everything is Terrible. For years now, they have been undertaking an ambitious project to acquire every single VHS copy of Jerry Maguire in North America. You will notice that I could only get a DVD copy because some supporter of Everything is Terrible up here in Vancouver has already snapped up all of this city's VHS copies and mailed them to LA. In 2017, the Everything is Terrible people opened a video store in LA that only stocked Jerry Maguire tapes, 14,000 in all. Since then, their collection has more than doubled in size, and their new goal is to eventually build a pyramid out of all of the tapes in the middle of the California desert. That is a pretty big commitment to a 30-year-old film that has yet to crack the IMDb Top 1000. So to get into the question of why people become such crazily slavish devotees of often mid-tier cultural products, I think we first have to deconstruct the idea of irony. Most people think of irony as just a sarcastic mockery of something, but as I have learned from my young friend JREG, there are actually many different flavors of irony in this world. And I would say that irony cults are a good example of so-called meta-irony, which is when it is hard to tell precisely what sort of feelings are animating an outwardly weird performance. For example, let's look at the irony cult that has built up around the most successful comic strip in history, Garfield. Weird meta-ironic Garfield art is everywhere these days, and there are two YouTube channels in particular that have done some really amazing Garfield-inspired work. Lasagna Cat, which was made by the media studio Fatal Farm, and Lumpy Touch, who is just a humble Canadian pixel artist. Both of them have made a whole bunch of Garfield-themed videos, most of which are incredibly bizarre and grotesque and can often come off as more than a little hostile to old Garfy. But on the other hand, it is also hard to imagine spending this much time and energy making art to boot something that you don't have at least a little underlying love for. I think it's possible the artists themselves don't even fully understand their motivation for making what they're making. They just feel a powerful creative compulsion to do it. Thus, meta 
irony. Now, Garfield is obviously very popular and has been a ubiquitous presence in American life for nearly 50 years now. And I think a lot of people, especially creative artist types, often have somewhat confused and conflicting emotions towards cultural products that are very popular and commercially successful. There is often annoyance at something that's so popular it seems to be everywhere, and resentment at the popular thing's objectively low level of quality. This is where I think ideas like building a Jerry Maguire pyramid or depicting Garfield as a god come from. It's inflating the relevance of mediocre middle-class entertainment to its most exaggerated extreme. But at the same time, despite ourselves, we may still have a lot of sentimentality and Nostalgia about mediocre middle-class entertainment. Anything super popular cannot help but define the rhythm and texture of our daily lives, becoming inseparable from other memories and experiences. Given how much ironic art tends to be backwards-looking, fixated on things that defined childhoods in particular, the subject of an irony cult can also represent a sort of re-engagement with a earlier version of ourselves. A younger version with simpler, less complicated tastes. But this may in turn breed feelings of guilt towards having any degree of affection for a piece of culture that is so mainstream and uncool, which then breeds the hostility. And I think that a successful irony cult leans into all of these feelings, often in overlapping, conflicting, and ambiguous ways. The irony cult around Shrek would be another good example. But before we get into that, let us just take a moment to talk about today's video sponsor, Displate. Hello friends, so this week's video was indeed brought to you by Displate, the fun and attractive metal poster people. Now as you can probably tell, I am a man who likes to surround himself with colorful knickknacks embodying all of my various hobbies and interests. And if you are a guy like me, then Displate.com is definitely the site for you. They sell these cool posters that have been printed directly onto sheets of lightweight metal, creating a long-lasting, versatile piece of art that is the perfect thing to add some color and personality to your home. And best of all, their selection is truly epic. They have over 1.3 million different poster designs you can choose from, including not only the original creations from thousands of independent artists, but a vast collection of officially authorized designs from major brands and studios, including Star Wars, Marvel, and Assassin's Creed. So let me show you a couple I got recently. So this one here is a replica of the box of the ice hockey uh, cartridge for the Atari, which came out in the 1980s. I thought that this was a good one for me to have as somebody who is both Canadian and also very interested in retro video game culture. And speaking of retro gaming culture, I also got this one featuring the ghost from Pac-Man. I thought this one was a kind of fun tribute to one of my favorite videos I've made, which is all about the Pac-Man ghosts and why they are not actually ghosts. So one of the few foreign trips that John F. Kennedy made during his brief presidency was to Canada, and this was considered a very big deal for Canada to have the glamorous president and his glamorous wife come up here. This was the cover of Life magazine commemorating that trip. Thought this one was a nice little tribute to that special moment in Canada-US history. And then lastly, I got this one, which is just an illustration of a pizza Godzilla monster. And I got this one just because I thought it was cool. The posters are all high quality and easy to mount using this sticker and magnet system. And if these things seem like something you might be interested in getting for yourself, the Displate people have a great offer for fans of this channel. If you click on the link in the thing below or use the promo code JJMC, you can get an incredible 20% off your first two Displate posters or 30% off your first order of three or more. So don't delay, give Displate a try today. Displate, you love it, we print it. So Shrek is of course a series of computer animated movies, the first of which came out in May of 2001. They were generally not not well liked by critics who had a lot of harsh words for the film's raunchy humor, obnoxious characters, and uninspired animation. I always remember this one review that said that Shrek and his friends look like models that came with the animation software. Nevertheless, the movies were huge hits at the box office, with Shrek 2 in particular being the most 
commercially successful animated film in American history when it came out in 2004. DreamWorks Studios sought to make the most of their new Smash franchise with a fire hose of merchandise, including Shrek toys, clothing, video games, and all manner of bizarre food products. And eventually, people started to build an irony cult to ruin Shrek. Many years later, artists and other creative types who had grown up during the peak years of Shrek mania started to dream up all sorts of zany ways to make Shrek even more omnipresent in the culture, creating all manner of Shrek-themed memes and gifs, programming mods to insert Shrek into games where he didn't belong, building giant monuments to Shrek like this guy did in this cornfield, and even holding Shrek-themed weddings. The Milwaukee-based art collective known as 3GI Industries is basically to Shrek what Everything is Terrible is to Jerry Maguire. They not only put on a yearly spectacle known as Shrek Fest, where huge crowds gather to dress up as Shrek characters, eat Shrek-related foods, and listen to Shrek-themed music from Shrek-themed bands, But in 2018, they also commissioned over 200 different animators, actors, and editors to crudely recreate the entire first movie from scratch, yielding what Wired Magazine called a chaotic remixed wonder. They are currently working on a sequel. Now, this is textbook meta-irony, right? On the one hand, given Shrek is one of the most notoriously over-commercialized cartoon characters in history, it is easy to interpret Shrek's irony cult as a hostile commentary on the smothering ultra-conformist nature of American consumerism. In fact, they have even created a Shrek slogan that is pretty explicitly cult-like. Shrek is love, Shrek is life. I believe that line originally came from a Shrek-themed porno. Anyway, a lot of this sort of Shrek content similarly doubles down on the idea that Shrek is a pretty unattractive looking character, born from an era of crappy CGI, with a lot of fan-made Shrek videos being intentionally badly animated, often to the point of outright nightmare fuel. In other words, a lot more laughing at Shrek, the soulless creation of American capitalism, than laughing with Shrek, the brave hero of far, far away. But on the other hand, obviously no one is getting a back tattoo of a character they have no genuine affinity for either. With Shrek, I think you can make a strong case that a significant portion of this sort of irony is quite defensive. A sort of permission structure, giving members of the self-conscious middle-aged middle class an opportunity to enjoy something they would otherwise be strongly encouraged not to, because you know, it's considered tasteless or lowbrow or whatever. Paradoxically, I also think that when one faction of society criticizes something too much for being too lowbrow, it can actually deepen and broaden the affection we feel for it. It's the classic underdog phenomenon. Making something the subject of scorn makes it look vulnerable and vulnerability is attractive, even if it's a green ogre. Now, with these examples in mind, I'm sure you can probably think of a few more examples of characters or franchises who have emerged at the center of irony cults of their own. I think the movie Die Hard is starting to approach this territory, especially in regards to the whole Christmas angle. There was a bit of an irony cult around Shia LaBeouf for a while, culminating in that bizarre musical number you may have seen. Back in the day, Chuck Norris probably had some of this through those jokes. The internet seems weirdly obsessed with Luigi in a meta-ironic way at the moment. Lumpy Touch, who I mentioned earlier, has done some pretty bizarre Luigi-themed stuff, not unlike his Garfield work. SpongeBob probably still enjoys too much mainstream, unironic appeal to really qualify, but I think as the generation that grew up with him gets older, you're starting to see people engage with the franchise in increasingly weird ways too, which would track with what I said before about the degree that a strong irony cult will often be quite backwards looking and nostalgic. I think you could even argue that some foods like bacon and pizza have become the center of 
little irony cults of their own in recent years, alongside maybe a couple more abstract things like unicorns or the poop emoji. But in any case, the common thread seems to be things that are very mainstream and commercially popular, while also being somewhat stigmatized as shallow or unsophisticated by middle-class guardians of good taste and respectability. So you heard it here first. If you are a struggling art collective looking for your big break, I have three words for you. Minions Taj Mahal. You can thank me later. Anyway, very curious to hear what you guys think about this topic of irony cults. If you find them funny or cool or cringe or what. And what cultural thing do you think would make for a good irony cult? Thank you so much for watching. Do not forget to check out Displate, and I will see you next week.